Hey friends, welcome back for another fun video. In this video, I'm going to delve with you into running totals and we're going to start basic and we're going to see what kind of stuff we're going to do in Power Query to make our running totals perform blazing fast. So after this video, you're going to know everything you need to know about running totals. Stay tuned. So for those who don't know me, my name is Rick from BI Gorilla. And this video, we're going to look a little bit into running totals in Power Query. You might have some requirement where you want to calculate the cumulative sum of something. And in the beginning, when I started out with this, I thought it was difficult, but most of all, it was annoying that those were always slow. Let's dive right in and see why that happens and what we can do about it. So let's work with the data I have on the screen here. I just have six different rows and an amount of the, uh, of the number of sales we've done. So here we see the sales amount and let's say we want to create a running total here. What kind of issues do you bump into when doing that? Okay, let's first have a look at two methods that I see most used and that are generally pretty slow. First of all, whenever you work with a data set like this, you always need to think about the sort order because if you have a running total, you want it to be in the right order. I'm going to make a copy of this one here and we're going to call this one Let's first look at the list first n. And I cannot have a dot in the name here, but we can just do list first n. So the first important thing when doing running totals is to sort your data. Okay, that's done. The next step is we need to make sure to calculate the cumulative sum. And what does that mean? That means that on the first row, we want to add the sum of just this one. On the second row, we want to add the sum of both 14 and 18. And on the third row, we want 37 in there as well to get your cumulative sum. Now, the easiest and slowest way to do this is to add a column from one. And we're going to use this column to say, I want to make a sum of the first value, the first two values, the first three values, the first four values. How does that work? Let's say we add a custom column. Now in this custom column, if I can move it around, I seem not to be able to. Can I do it now? Yes. In this custom column, we can use the uh, list first n function. Now the list first n function lets you retrieve a list of values and then just lets you tell how many of those values you actually want to see. So what is the list of values we want to work with? It's the values in the amount column. And I can reference that value by first mentioning this name of the table step, the name of the step, which is a table, it's called edit index. And then we want to reference the amount column. So we can write um, edit index. And then between square brackets, I write amount. This is my first step running total, I will call this. So this creates a column that contains a list with the values of the amount column. And we can see that by clicking on the white space next to the list. And as you can see, the values 14 to 30 are all in here. And that happens for each of the rows. Now you can work with this. If you change your formula here and add list first n, this function wants a list as input and lets you return only some of the values in the list. So we first start again with this whole list of items. And then we can say, I want to have the, for example, the first one or the first two or the first three items. Conveniently, we have this index column, which we can reference. So I'm going to reference index. If I close my parentheses, we're going to have the same column, but then with different items in the list. So our first row has only a single value. The second one is two values, three, four, five, six. So as you can see on each of the lines, if we would want to do a running total, we now have the values that we need to add up. And the only thing left for us to do, I'm going to put this on the new line, is to wrap the list that we have here in the list sum function. And by clicking, we now already have our first running total here. So 14 is actually the 14 right there. And if we want to have, let's see. Ooh, that doesn't look too good. Uh, so we start with 14, and then we get to 14 plus 18 is 32, and then the first three together is 69, etc. That's our running total. Perfect. You'd be done, you think. In a similar fashion, I'm going to copy this query, duplicate, 
and we're going to change this around just slightly. In a similar fashion, we can also use the list range function. So we can reference the, the column name again by writing, um, here we go, edit index, and we have the amount column. And this first generates the list that we just had as well. And now instead, we can write list range. And the list range function, just like list first n, it requires a list to start with. And then you can give indicate a range that you want to return. Now, the second argument asks how many of the values you want to offset for your range. I'm going to say I want to start at the beginning. And then how many items do you want to return? So similar as list first n, I could write the index column because the index column will show us how many of the values we want to retrieve. So similarly now, we only retrieve the values we need for the running total and wrap this in the list sum function and we have a running total. Okay, so Rick, what's the problem you're asking me? Because we now actually have a running total, right? You're correct. So in principle, if you don't have too much data, this, fun, uh, this setup here, it works just fine. Now let's say you have a lot of data. There's two big problems with these approaches. Let me just rename this one as well here. So we have list range. The two big problems that we have, I can indicate by just going back a step here. So let's say we are back at the number of, uh, at the list values that we want to want to sum up. So let's go back here. So on the first line, we want to sum up 14, then 14 and 18, 14, 37, etc. Now the big problem here is, first of all, we always have to keep on retrieving this data. So for each of these steps, Power Query has to go back to the edit index step and find the values in the amount column. And because it repeatedly has to do this, it is going to cost a little bit of extra time to do this. So the bigger problem here is that Power Query does not hold these values in memory. Now there's an easy fix for this. Let me show you. So instead of referencing this, uh, this step name here called edit index and the amount, what we can also do is we can just, after this edit index step, we're going to add another step here. And over here, we're first of all going to reference that amount column. So far, nothing changes. We just have this list here. But you can tell Power Query to keep this in memory. And by telling it to keep it in memory, you're going to already see a substantial speed benefit. And you can do that by using the list buffer function. So simply by wrapping this in list buffer, the result stays the same, but Power Query puts it in memory. For, so for that, the calculations actually can, uh, can make use of that in memory uh, list of values. I can call this buffered values. And in our latest step here, instead of, well, first of all, of course, it now references the wrong step. So if I want this to work, I can go back and write edit index again. And same for this one, and it's index. So this now still works, but to make sure that it uses the, the list we have in memory, you now need to adjust the first argument of list range. And over here, you can now write buffered values. And the good thing about that is, is that the result here stays the same, but that it uses the in-memory list. One of the big performance benefits already. Okay, so what is another problem of this approach? So the first problem we solve now with the buffered values, but maybe a bigger problem here is that we're doing a lot of unnecessary calculations. What do I mean by that? On the first step that we are, that we have, we need to sum up 14. That's okay. On the second step, we again need to sum up 14 and 18. Then we need to sum up 14, 18 and 37, 14, 18, 37 and 35. And imagine doing this for a big data set where maybe you have a million of rows. Even if Power Query holds these in memory, the calculation still requires you to add all of these numbers again and again. And that's a big problem because these are unnecessary calculations that, that cost you the compute resources of your computer. So what can you do instead? Well, let's imagine that after each of the running totals, 
for each of the rows, we could save the result of that so that when you get, for example, to number two, you have 14 plus 18 is 32. But let's say you're at 30, the third line. What if you could simply add 32 plus 37? So instead of adding three values, you now only add two values. And what if you would get to the fourth line here and you would still remember what the addition was in the previous line, what the running total was up to that moment, and you would only have to add the latest number to it. That would save you a lot, a lot of compute resources, especially when you get to, let's say line thousand, because instead of adding up a thousand separate steps, it would just have to pick the running total from the previous step and add a single value to it. Now, that's what we're going to look at now to make sure we can also work with very fast performing running totals. So the slow running totals were list first and a list range. And now let's have a quick look at a quick performing one. And the one I'm going to show you is from list generate. So list generate here, I'm going to take some steps back, but it does not require us to have an index. Okay. So with this data set in place, I already see that the data is sorted by date. And also for list generate, I'm also going to use the buffered value step. Now, what's going to be different now is list generate allows you to write away the sum of a certain step. And the sum of that step, I can reuse in the next step. So let's give that a try. So to get started with that, I'm going to create a separate step here. And it starts with list generate. And if you don't know how that works, I have a video about that. And list generate first wants you to create uh, a starting value. So we're going to create a record and we're going to create running a running total. This is going to be the value of the running total. And as a starting value, my running total should equal the sum of only the first value here. So I could write my running total equals, then I'm going to reference the buffered list from the previous step. So I could write buffered values and only the first value. And then something else I need, I need something so Power Query, uh, so list generate knows when to stop doing the running total calculations. And I'm going to make use of a counter for this. So at the starting value, my counter is equal to zero. But this is going to increase with each of the running total uh, uh, calculations we do. So this in principle makes uh, uh, the, the start or the initial value of list generate. The second argument requires us to write for the condition for how long the running total should run for. So I could write something like, okay, I want to make a running total as long as this counter that we have that is going to increase with each step, but as long as that one is smaller than the number of values in this list. So I could write list count, and I'm going to count the amount of values in the buffered values list. So I write buffered values. Okay, that's all that we need for this. And I'm saying smaller than because the Power Query index starts at zero. So because we start at zero, the index is going to end at five and not at six. And that's why we need this list count to be smaller than. Now things get exciting because the third argument in list generate requires us to indicate each of the steps that it takes, what should Power Query do? So what it should do is of course define the, the height of this new value. So I'm going to have to define what the run, running total will be. And our running total will be the value of the previous running total value plus an additional value of the next row. So I could write here, my running total value equals the running total of the previous row. And I'm going to add here, I want to go to the buffered values list, and then I want to find the next value in the list. And normally my first value is zero here. Uh, which equals the counter, but now I actually want to find the next value, which will always be the counter that I have, but then plus one value. So I could say, pick the previous counter value, which was zero, and add plus one. And then by doing this, you find the next value in your list. So by summing up the previous value in your, the previous running total, 
and the next value that we have, you find your next running total value. And what's left is we still need to define our counter and the counter is the value of counter and then plus one. That's all that we need. Now with this, we have the, the draft ready for our list generate function. Now, when we press OK, the result of this is a list of records. So we started with a record and we also defined uh, what the field should look like in the record. But the result of this is also a record. So our running total, the first record chart with 14, then we go to 32, 69, 104, 138 and 168. So that, in fact, is the running total over here. Now, if we only want to return one of the columns, there is another argument to list generate, which is the selector. It's optional, but it's very useful if you want to return just a partial part of a, of a record, or if you want to do a calculation on top of the already generated list. But in this case, I'm just writing that I want to return the running total by writing each and then the running total column name. And here I have an error. Why is that? The field running total of the record wasn't found. Ah, I have a space there and I should remove the space. Okay. So the buffered value step was earlier, just like this. And this now creates our running total list. Great. Now, the question you might ask yourself is, Okay, list first n and list range resulted in me having another column in my base table. And now we're looking at a list of values which is separate from my table. So how are we going to make sure those fit together? Well, before we get there, let's first just have a quick look at why we did this and what the effect is. So the reason why we did this is that list generate is able to save a value in its memory and only add the next value to it which is going to give us a lot of uh, savings in calculation time, especially for larger data sets. That's why we're doing it. Another benefit is, since we're only having to do this once, we only, uh, since we only have to calculate uh, values one by one, that's also a time saver. But the big downside is, we now only have a list that's separate, and we still need to stick those together. So how can we do that? Well, let's have a quick look because we actually already have a source table here. I'm going to call this one data set or uh, main data. Why don't we call this main data? And this main data, what we want to do with this, we actually want to attach the running total list to it. And you can do that in several ways, but I'm going to show you a way that's uh, pretty short and efficient. And that's the following. So. If you have a main table like this and you want to attach something to it, there is not an easy function for it uh, because by adding a custom column, you're and if you would add this list to it, you would actually add all the all the values of the list. But what we could also do is we first put all of all, the, all of the columns from the main table. We transform that one into a list of list values. Well, we already had a list of running total values, and then we can combine all of those together and transform it back into a table. Let me show you what I mean. So if I go to a new step here, and our first step was, would be from the main data part. So this step is now called consolidation. This data here, I don't want to have it as a table because there's no function available where I can easily attach a list and then just items from the list in here. So what I could do is I could write table to columns. And what's going to happen with these three columns is I'm just going to have a list of lists here. So this is the first column, the date column. This is the second column and the amount column. Now what I can do is on top of this, I could write the ampersand and then I can write running total list. Now, that's not completely what I wanted to, because this was a list with lists. So by adding this list value here, you have three lists of lists and then the values. So we need to wrap this in another uh, curly bracket. Here we go. So, so far, so good. And we have attached these together. 
And now what's left for us to do is to create, to, to transform these again to a table. So what you can then do, we can write table from list. And table from list, ooh, table from list wants a list of lists, which is what we just had here. And what they then want is to still make sure you get the, um, the right column names. But let's first try this. Um, so we could, for example, say table dot column names. The next argument is the column names. So the column names of our main data. And then we want to add another column called running total. type function and now i'm gonna just have to quickly peek because there's something wrong here so i go to my running total table to column table column names i'm just gonna peek a little bit here and put it back there, right there ah one mistake i made here we need the table from columns not table from list table from columns there we go so our table from columns here combined the main columns here with these. And as you can tell, most of the data types have been uh, consistent. So they remained. So in my main data, I had data types and those are still the same here. But there is one thing that you might notice and that is that the running total here does not have a data type. And the reason for that is that when we, when we actually transformed these columns into a list, they knew what data type was here. But at the moment that we transformed this buffered value list into a list right here, it didn't actually remember or it didn't actually know what kind of data type it was. So what we can do is still make sure we define a data type here. And we can do that. And I'm going to show you what code works for that by writing. Here we go. You can use the value replace type and then actually give a type to this, uh, to the list that we have. So I can incorporate it right here. So we have value replace type. And then we have the list that we had before. And here comes the fun part. We can then say type. And as a type, you could write type list, but we don't define what kind of items are in the list. But you could also open a curly bracket and then say, like, I only have whole numbers in here. So the in 64 type. And then you close your brackets again and you close your brackets again. Uh, let me see if I replace type. I need to close these brackets. And in principle, you have now made sure that the list of values receive the data type. And by doing that, that actually allows you to combine the different lists, but also remain, uh, will also keep the data type or also define the data type that you need. Okay, so that is the first fast method that we have. And it's fast because we don't have uh, unnecessary calculations and we keep all the values that we use in memory as a buffered value here. Now, I have another way in which you could do this, and that is with list, uh, list accumulate. Very tough formula, so I'm just going to show it to you. But the other way we could do it is like this. So we go to just a running total step. So list accumulate is very similar to list generate. The only difference being that we don't make a condition of when the generation of a list ends, but we actually have a fixed amount of items in the, for, for which a list will be created. And in this case, a list accumulate starts with a, a starting list. And this start, this list we're going to add up. I'm going to skip the first value here. That's why I have it here. I'm going to skip the first value because my starting value is already the first one. So the 14, I already have it. So the list we're going to iterate through, I'm going to skip it. But because I want my calculation to go on until the last one, I just added an empty value at the end of the list. Okay. Second argument of list accumulate. The second argument shows what the starting value or the, the seed or initial value is. Now, since we have multiple, I create a record 
and my running total value uh, starts with nothing. So it's empty at the start, but then the current value that we're going to use is the first value in my buffered values from the previous step. Then we get to the third argument. The third argument will let you know what to do with each of the steps that the list accumulated writes through. And what it shows is that it starts with the current value and the current value is actually the sum of the value that the current value has, the first one. And then on top of that, it adds the current, the current part. And this current one is always a value from the list that we have in the beginning here. So whereas the first time we iterated, we just had this first value. The second time that it iterated, it also got the first value from this list, which resulted in our uh, in, ad in adding things to our running total. And at the second part here, I'm saying that the running total result um, will create a list. So I'm starting with a value here, which is the empty list. And then I'm just as a list adding all the current values, which will result in our running total list. Now there's one thing that I haven't mentioned to you yet, which is important to make your solutions stable. If we go back to this list generate example, this was our definition of it. But there's one problem with this. If we go to our main source and over here, I would remove the value 37. And then we change the data tag to amount. We're going to see that one of the values has a null value, which is different from zero. So instead of having a, a number that it can add up, it has a missing value. Now, missing values have a particular characteristic. So if you pick like a value like 18 and you add plus null, the result is null. What does that mean for our function? If I go to my running total list, you will find that it takes 14, 32, and after it reaches the null value, no other additions are being done. And I find this a, a pitfall of the current setup of this function. So one slight adjustment that I would do is instead of making sure to add numbers, like we're doing in this part, you can also use the list sum function. And the list sum function has some error checking in there that at the moment you have a null value, it actually allows you to um, treat it as, as if it was a zero or treat it as if it wasn't there. So let's let's try that out. I could write list sum here. And list sum wants, you, wants to add a list of values. So you open a curly bracket. Then we don't need to add this plus sign, but we can just add a comma because the second value that's right here is simply going to be an item within the list. And all of the items within the list will be added anyway. Then we need to close our curly bracket and close our parenthesis. And by doing that, the null value that we had earlier here, it actually doesn't impact our calculations. And it just makes it a little bit more robust. Now, that was a lot for a single video. Um, what you learned was that there's pitfalls, that there's slow and fast methods. I recommend the list generate version. And if this was a bit too quick for you, on my website, you can find an elaborate article and you can copy paste both the code and download the file. Now, you might also be interested in doing this calculation, not just for a data set that we have right here, but maybe you want to do it by category or by group. Well, the good news is I have a video coming out for that as well. And the blog post is out already. So if you want to, if you don't want to miss that one, make sure to subscribe to my channel. And with that, check out the next video to know uh, how to get your group running totals. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.